Okay, so welcome everyone to this talk on ACCA Streams. Uh, I'm Jacek Kunicki, I've already been introduced. So, Software Mill is a software house from based in Poland. We are 100% remote and flat. So, if after this talk you wanted to discuss either ACCA Streams or remote work or flat companies, I, I'll be here to talk with you. Uh, as, as mentioned, the ACCA Streams has already been there today, so I'll try to refer to specifically Jamie's concerns about comparing it to Monix. So we'll get to this later, but now let's just focus on, on the topic, the ACCA Streams. So ACCA Streams basically is about stream processing. And in general, if you think about a stream processing architecture, it's pretty simple. So you have a source of your data that you want to process. Uh, you have a place, uh, a target for your data, so you can call it a consumer. And you have a number of processing stages, so you do something with your data. Now, in a traditional stream processing architecture, you have the data flowing from, uh, from the producer to the consumer, and that's it. But in reactive streams, there is uh, an addition to it, quite an important one. Uh, now, try to imagine a scenario where, but basically there are two scenarios you can imagine. Uh, first one is uh, when the producer is slow and the consumer is fast. And in such a scenario, it's, well, you basically have no problems because the slow producer is producing, it, producing the data, the consumer is pretty fast, so it's consuming it, and, well, you, you won't expect any problems here. But if you go another, the other way around, where you have a fast producer and a slow consumer, there is a danger that the consumer will be flooded by data because the fast producer will produce a lot of data and the, the consumer may not be able to cope with it. And for this, well, to solve this problem, uh, in, reactive, in the reactive streams approach, we have something called back pressure. So back pressure is basically at some, some type of data which is, you can say, flowing in the opposite direction to the, to the real data. And in the, uh, in, in the ACCA streams approach, uh, the back pressure is based on, uh, on the consumer requesting a number of data from the producer. This way, when the, when the consumer says how much data it's able to process at a given point of time, uh, there, is one, there is again no danger that it will be flooded because the, the producer is not allowed to produce any more data that the consumer is actually able to consume at any given moment. So this is the general naming for a stream processing architecture. Uh, ACCA Streams has its uh, own names, so let's see what, the, what they are. The producer in ACCA Streams is called the source, the consumer is called the sink, the processing stages, the intermediate ones, are called flows. Now, all of them together form something that is called a graph. And the, the, the graph name may be a little bit confusing because in terms of the API, the ACCA Streams API, uh, all of the elements like source, flows, and sinks are also graphs. And in general, they also form a graph. But this is like, we will be able to see it later. So the stream processing world is quite huge. Uh, here's a slide from my colleague's talk about an in introduction to big data. You can see a number of stream processing technologies here, and ACCA Streams is not even among them. So we, you may wonder how ACCA Streams is different from the, from the approaches we can see here. Well, first of all, ACCA Streams tends not to be distributed, unlike, for example, Spark Streaming. Well, this is not always the case, because in ACCA Streams, as we will see later, you decouple the, the definition of, uh, of how you process the data from the actual infrastructure on which your, your graph is run. And the, the infrastructure in terms of ACCA Streams is called a materializer. So you have a materializer that is actually responsible for running the data. ACCA Streams has a built-in materializer that is based on actor systems, and it, this is the default one. But there, are also, there is also an API for materializers, which lets other people create their own. And there was, well, the guys from Apache Gear Pump tried to build their own materializer. It was announced uh, on, in autumn last year. But actually, it seems like the, the project is, is dead. So the, the, it, it was announced, they, they, they had some, some beta version, but I, I haven't heard anything more about it. I also talked to the ACCA Streams guys, and they also didn't hear about, about any success of Apache Gear Pump. So, at the moment, the, the actor-based implementation remains the, well, the status quo. So it's there, it's the default one, and you will be using it. When defining a, pro, a stream processing pipeline in ACCA Streams, uh, what you do is to is define some a kind of reusable building blocks. So basically, you, 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 you write code for the, for the pieces uh, of, uh, yeah, for the blocks that will be processing your data. And it's important that all the blocks are lazy. So when, when writing the code, 
like when, when you define the blocks, you don't, don't execute anything. So you, the, n n nothing is actually processed. You, you, may be, you need to be really explicit about actually running the entire graph. So the, the, building block, the building blocks are a kind of a recipe for processing the data, and then you need to explicitly specify an, some kind of infrastructure, the materializer, which will be used to, to actually run the data processing. So now let's go to, to our example use case that I'll be covering today in the live coding session. So overall, it's going to be about importing gzipped files into Cassandra with some intermediate processing. Now, when you look at the structure of the gzipped files, you can see that there are uh, lines, like a semicolon separated IDs and values, and every, every, every two subsequent lines share the same ID. And what we will be doing, we'll be taking the, the lines sharing the ID and then averaging them by the ID and storing the average value in Cassandra. And you may notice that not all of the lines need to contain a valid value. There will be some invalid ones indicated by an invalid value. And when we indicate a line with invalid value, uh, well, if it's an only one, we'll be taking the other one as the average. When both of the lines are invalid, we'll just be taking a dummy value of minus one to store in the database. And Cassandra is, well, of, of course, for this scale, uh, which we will be dealing with, you could choose any database. But actually, this talk is based on a real world project, and we use Cassandra there, so I'm also using Cassandra here. OK, let's go to the live coding part now. So we have a, like some, some, infra, some starting point for our code. Uh, we have some configuration parameters, an import directory, number of lines we want to skip from the file because it can contain a header, the number of concurrent files uh, we want to process, the number of concurrent writes we want to uh, make to the database, and also a parallelism level for non-IO operations, so for all the in-memory stuff that we're going to, to do. I'm going to, like, well, you're going to see them later when we actually use them. So first of all, and now the, the, the first part of code I'm going to write is not about ACCA streams, it's just about parsing a line that you saw on the slide. So let's start for a simple method for parsing a line. And we also be using the, the path to the file for well, debugging purposes. So we have a, a path to the file that's going to be a string. And the actual line we want to parse, it's also a string. This comes as the other set of parameter because uh, parameters we, because we, we want to be able to partially apply the function. You will see why later. And it's going to return a future. Basically, we're, we're going to be asynchronous as much as possible here. And it's a future of a reading. Now, what's a reading? A reading is our domain model, and it's basically a, a trait that specifies an ID. And then we can, we, we can have two, two sub-traits, so sub-classes. First, first of them is a valid reading that has an ID and a value, and an invalid one that just has an ID. And since we want to be like, gracefully handling the invalid lines, we want to model them in our domain model. That's why we're introducing the invalid uh, ID as well. So we're going to be asynchronous, so we're returning a future. Then what we do first, we split the line by the semicolon. We are going to call this variable fields. Now we take the first field, uh, convert it to an integer, and it's going to be our ID. The second field we are converting to double and it's going to be our value. And we could return a valid reading of the ID and the value. Now this is the happy path when everything goes fine, when all both the lines are valid. And as I said, we, want, we also want to be able to handle the invalid lines. So let's wrap it in a try catch. Well, we'll be tr catching everything. You shouldn't normally do it, but for the sake of this presentation, I'll do it. Uh, we'll do some logging. That's why we need the file path to be able to do some, some debug logging. Uh, and we're going to return an invalid reading which contains the ID. So this is, I think, the code is pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. We're just like splitting the line and returning our domain object. It has nothing to do with ACCA streams so far. 
Now, since uh, we're going to, of course, we won't be reading entire files into memory. We want to be streaming data from, from the files. Uh, so we'll, we'll be working on some, on, on some sequence of, of bytes that, that we would then want to split by the new line character because, well, that's how the lines are delimited in the file. So we're going to define our own delimiter. And now we start to play with the ACA streams API. So most of the time we'll be using the concept of a flow. And flow in ACA streams is a definition how, of how the data is processed. Now you can see three generic types here. Here, first is the input type, so that the type of the data that's coming in. Then there's the output type, so the data that is going out. And the third one, the mat, is something that is called a materialized value. So what is that? If you imagine a, a stream processing pipeline, you have some, some data that is flowing between the, between the building blocks. So you can say that it's internal to the, to, the, to the pipeline, it's not visible from the outside world. So those are the in and out types, because the, those are the types of data that like, flows internally in the stream. But it's also possible to emit some data to the outside world, so to communicate with the outside world. And that's actually what the materialized value is. So the materialized value is, some, is, is the type of the value that can possibly be emitted to the outside world and to be visible from outside the stream. So in our case, uh, when, when delimiting the, the stream of bytes by, by a new line character, we'll be working with a flow whose uh, input type is a byte string. It's basically an ACA streams wrapper for a sequence of bytes. The output type will also be a byte string because we'll be still emitting sequences of bytes, but different than those that come, came inside because they would be already representing our lines. And for the materialized value, well, we won't actually be using it. We will be using a special type called not used. You can, you can wonder why, why don't we use uh, unit, for example. So the reason is that uh, ACA streams has, a, has both a Scala API and Java API. And the, like the creators of ACA streams wanted uh, the APIs to be unified between Scala and Java. So in Scala you have unit, in Java you have void, and not used is basically a connection between them so that you can use the same API from Scala and from Java. So it's not, not, not normally you cannot uh, interoperate between void and unit, so not used is here to help. Now to, to do the delimiting, we have some built-in helpers called framing delimiter. And of course, well, first of all, we need to specify the, the, the like sequence of characters by which we want to delimit. In our case, it's the new line character. We need to specify the maximum length of a line. In our case, the lines are pretty short, so 128 is a reasonable default. And there is a third parameter we can specify. It's called allow truncation. And it's basically, it basically says what is going to happen when, uh, when a delimited line doesn't contain, like when the, the buffer um, which we are using to delimit does not contain the new line character. So you can imagine that in a file you may not have the new line character at the very end of file. And unless you set the allow truncation flag to true, it would fail. So there will, there will be an exception. We want to accept such lines, so, so such files with no new line character at the end. So that's why we are setting the flag to true. So this is the first flow, so the first building block we defined using the streams API to divide our data into lines. So we're getting, we're getting a stream of bytes and we're get in, we're getting a stream of bytes out, but the, the output bytes are already representing our lines. The second flow we are going to define will be about uh, parsing files. So its type is going to be a flow. Uh, as I said, we'll be using it heavily. And we'll start with a file, the Java.io file. And we are going to emit readings. Now, at, at, at the moment, those, are, those can either be valid or invalid. So we'll be, we'll be dealing with both of them later. Uh, at this step, this is just a, a reading. And once again, we won't be using the materialized value. So we are once again using the not used type. So when defining flows, you start with a flow object, uh, which has an uh, apply method with a type. So if you want to build a flow that accepts file, you should just say flow of file. And then you have a number of methods here. Some of them resemble the, the methods from the collection API. Some of them are specific to ACA streams. 
In this case, uh, we're going to use something called flatmap concat. And I'll just try to write some code inside and then explain why it's flatmap concat. So don't be scared. Uh, so far, what you need to know about flatmap concat uh, is that it uh, gives us access to a, to a single file. And I'll explain in a moment what, what exactly it does. So having a file, since it's gzipped, we need to construct a gzip input stream. This needs to wrap an, a file input stream from our file. Uh, and we're calling to call it an input stream. Now we have, uh, Akka Streams has some built-in support to transform input streams to, to sources of data. We have a stream uh, converters object that has a from input stream method and it accepts a function that, that returns an input stream. And now what we want to do is have, having a source of, uh, of, of bytes, we want to transform it in a number of ways. So the, 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 first of, the first transformation is our line delimiter that we defined previously. So we're using the via keyword to, to say that we want to like pipe the data from the source through some, through some other flow. So our line delimiter that we defined before is a flow, so we can use it inside the via method. Now what we want to do is we potentially want to drop a number of lines from the, like the, the file header, for example. We had, a, we had a configuration parameter for that. So like uh, similarly to collect the collection API, we can just say that we want to drop a number of items. It's line to skip. And now what we want to do, well, we, we want to use the parse line method that we defined at the very beginning, but the parse line method works on strings. And what we have as an output from our line delimiter is a byte string. So first of all, we need to convert the byte string into a normal string. So also similarly to the collection API, we can use the map method. And fortunately, the byte string has, has a, sorry, has a utility method called utf8 string. It's not to string but it's something similar. And it just gives us an, a normal string. And now the last thing we want to do is to asynchronously use our parse line method to convert the lines to our domain objects. So we have a map, map async method in which, first of all, we need to specify the parallelism level. Uh, in our case, it's going to be the non-IO parallelism because this is an in-memory in transformation, no input-output required. Uh, and here, we're just calling the, now we're partially applying the parse line method to, uh, to the path of the file. And as you may remember, the partial application returns a function that takes a string. So we can, we can basically pass the, pass the partially applied function to, to map async because, well, here inside, uh, we want something that takes a string and returns a future. And this is basically what, what the, our partially applied function does. Now, what is a flat map concat here? So if you imagine, well, the, the, ty the type of the data that, that is returned here by from input stream is a source. So now for every file, we, cr we are creating a source in terms of the Akka Streams API. And actually what we want, we don't want multiple sources that are emitting readings. We want to have a single source of readings. So what Flatmap Concat does, it takes a number of sources, like we have a source for every file, and then it, 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 it concatenates them and, 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 and turns them into a single source. So from, from, from a number of sources created from every file, we're going to end up with a single source that's going to emit readings. So this is what Flatmap Concat does. So in this flow, we're taking, uh, we're taking files. Every file is converted into a number of, well, into a source of readings. Then we are flattening those sources and emitting a reading by reading downstream. So the next step, having the actual readings, so having, having the data converted into our domain model, is to compute the average. So this is the next flow we're going to define. And this is going to be a flow that takes a reading and emits a valid reading. Because if, well, our, uh, our database code is, is only accepting valid readings. So now what we want to do, we will, we'll, we'll be taking a stream of readings, grouping them into groups of two, because they, they represent the subsequent lines. 
and then trying to average them by ID, uh, bearing in mind that we may have an invalid value and then we'll possibly be emitting a, a dummy value of minus one, but wrapped in a valid reading, because we'll always be able to take the ID. If we are able to take a valid value, then that's great. If not, we'll be emitting a, a dummy value of minus one downstream. And the materialized value is once again not used. So once again, we're using the flow, the, the apply method of the flow object to create a new flow, which takes a reading. Now what we want to do is convert the, it's, it's like group the readings into groups of two. So we'll just say grouped two. And then what we want to do is also asynchronously convert them into, like, like com com compute the average. Now, we're going to be using the map async unordered method. And in the previous step, you can see that we use the, the map async variant. Here we have map async unordered. The difference is that in map async, the, uh, the order of the results that are emitted downstream is the same as the order of the data that, that, that came in. In map async unordered, the data came in, some asynchronous computations are executed, and the elements are emitted downstream like as soon as the computation is finished, so the order may be different. Of course, the unordered version is, is faster, but sometimes you care about the order, as we did in the, in the parse files flow. Because in parse file, we wanted to emit the, the lines down, downstream, uh, well, we, we, we didn't want them to be mixed, because we are, we'll be now grouping them by ID. Here we'll be or like, like aggregating the lines and emitting only single, single valid readings downstream. So we don't care about the order. That's why we can use the, map, the, the unordered variant, which can be faster. Similarly to map async, it also has the parallelism parameter. Uh, and it takes a closure, which uh, yeah, it gives us readings. So we will have a sequence of readings available here. Uh, we want to be async, so we'll uh, wrap our average computations in, in a future. And what we do now, well, first of all, we need, to, we need to extract valid readings from the readings we got, because none of them, well, not all of them need to be valid. Uh, so we say readings collect, and we do pattern matching on, on only on valid readings. So this is basically filtering by the, by the type of the reading. You may wonder how is it different from the filter method. Well, if we, if we had a collection of a sequence of readings and we use the filter method, we would have also a sequence of readings as the output. Uh, but when using collect, since this is, a par this is a partial function inside collect, it can change the type. And so we, if, we only, if we only match on valid readings, the output type will be a sequence of valid readings. So apart from filtering the, the collection, we also change the, the type. And this is what we want because then we want to, to be able to access the value from the collection. So filter would only give us a sequence of reading, collect uh, when, when only matching on valid readings, give us a sequence of valid reading. So let's, let's just use a variable for that. And now we, we can compute the average. Well, uh, during the Spotify talk, you've, uh, you've heard that the naive approach of, uh, of summing and dividing by the size is not always good, but I'm going to, to, to use it here. It's not that, that big scale, so I, I don't expect any problems here. So we'll say that if uh, valid readings is not empty, uh, we're going to take the valid readings, map them to, to the value, and that's why we needed to, to, to have a sequence of valid reading, not of a reading, because then we can, we can just, we, we, can, we can extract the value. And we sum it and divide it by the size of valid readings. Otherwise, we're returning the dummy value of minus one. And the last step is to wrap, ever, wrap the average and the ID in a valid reading that will be emitted downstream. So we have a valid reading here. And now we had a group of two readings either valid or invalid, but even an invalid reading contains an ID. So we can safely, safely just take the first reading and extract the ID from here. And as the value, we're going to use our average. So what we did in this step, once again, was to take a stream of readings, group them into groups of two, then process the, the groups of two in an asynchronous manner, uh, and uh, not caring about the, the order of results. So, so that's why we use the map async unordered method, because, well, we don't care about the order in which they are emitted downstream. 
So now let's, uh, like ha having defined a, a, base, a few basic building blocks, let's see how, how we can combine them together. Because, well, you, you, you have three, two building blocks here and we want to, bu to build a bigger building block out of them. And actually it's pretty easy. So we'll create a flow called process single file. And it's going to be a flow that uh, takes a file and emits a valid reading and with no materialized value. So once again we start with the apply method of the, of, of the flow object. And then we'll just be using the via combinator to, to, to include the subsequent processing stages. So the first processing stage uh, will be uh, parse files and then we're going to say compute average. And that's it. And uh, an important thing and a useful thing here is that uh, this, is, this is type safe. So the, the compiler guards us against combining uh, flows that have, uh, that have uh, not compliant types of input and output data. So for example, if we switch the order of the lines, it would not compile because the, the input and output types won't match. So we, we, we are safe at compile time in, in terms of the types we are passing between the, between the building blocks. Now the last thing we want to, the last building block that we need to define is a sync that will accept the valid readings and store them in the database. We won't be pushing anything uh, farther downstream, so that's why it, it won't be a flow this time, but a sync. So a part of a stream that does, just has an input and doesn't have an output. We'll call it store readings. And this is going to be a sync. There's a separate type for that. It would accept a valid reading. And now in, in the, the sync as a second type parameter also has the materialized value because similarly to a flow. And uh, this time we want to be using the, the materialized value. Actually, we don't care about the, about the data that, uh, well, we'll be having result sets that are emitted by the database safe method, but we, we'll, we, we won't care about them. We'll only care about the fact that the processing was finished. So we'll use a special type of a built-in sync that basically waits for all the data to come in, waits for the computation to finish, and it returns a future uh, on which we can wait for, for the completion of the process. So we'll be use the, the, the materialized value here will be a future of something called done. And done is similar to not used. It's basically an interop between Scala and Java and between uh, Scala's unit and Java's void. Perhaps the name better suits the, I don't know, the, the, the return type. That's why not used is not used here, but instead we're using done. But, but like underneath it's, it's, it's very similar. It's basically something that connects Java and Scala. So we'll start with a flow here that accepts a valid reading. Now we want to uh, use the map, map async unordered once again, but this time with a different parallelism level because now we're, do, we're doing I.O., we're do, doing database writes. So we have a configuration parameter for that called concurrent writes. And we have some reading repository that has a safe method that basically accepts a valid reading and returns a future of unit. And that's what you, all, all you need to know about this method. It does, it, it writes to, the, to Cassandra internally, but well, we don't know, we don't need to dig into details uh, for the sake of this presentation. So we'll just, we'll just be calling reading repository safe. And now we want to, to connect our flow to a sync. So, so b because we want to return a sync, and as I said, we'll be using a special kind of sync that just waits for the data to be processed. And it's called sync ignore. Now, uh, when uh, when connecting two things in ACCA streams, here we are connecting a flow and the sync. Uh, you may need to, to choose which materialized value you want to take because each of them can have materialized value. So, for example, in our case, uh, we're having a flow on the right, on the left. Excuse me, it's your left, my right. So we're having a flow on the left and the sync on the right, and we're using the toMat method to connect them. And then we want to choose which materialized value we want. In our case, we want the materialized value from the sync. Uh, that's we are, why we are say, we would be saying keep right. So if you have a, a flow that has a materialized value of type M1 and the sync that has a materialized value of M2, and when, when joining them with toMat, when you say keep right, 
uh, you will have the, the materialized value from the sink, so you will have M2. If you set keep left, for example, you would have the materialized value from the flow, so M1. You also have a possibility to take both of the values and then you, you could say keep both. Then you will have a tuple of type M1, M2. You could also say not to take any of those and you, you, can say, you then can say keep none and then the return type will be not used. So in our case, like once again, we're joining the, uh, the flow on the left, the sink on the right. We want to take the material of this value from the right hand side, so from the sink. That's why we'll say uh, keep right here. Mm. Yeah, keep right. Okay, so now we have all of the building blocks and we have an empty method import from files below. So let's try to, to wrap everything together. And of course, we're going to need a source because we'll so, so far we have defined the intermediate stages to process our data. We have defined uh, the consumer or the sink in terms of ACA streams, but we don't have the source. So we'll also be defining it here. So first of all, we have a configuration parameter from the import directory. So we just say list files and convert them to list because it would be easier to use it as a source. We'll call it files. Uh, now let's do some uh, some logging for just for, for the sake of readability. Uh, we'll also track our start time to see how, how much the data processing took. And what we are going to do now is create a source. And for creating uh, sources from different types of data, you have you have the source object. And the, the most straightforward use case when you just have an iterable, you can just use the apply method. Uh, so we create a source of files and now we want uh, to use the, the via combinator to pipe the, the data from the source through our process single file stage. And the process single file was, uh, was, was the combination of parsing files and computing the average. Uh, and, uh, well, we want to direct the data to our sink and then, and then run the entire graph. So normally you could use a two method, so to, to connect a sink and then a run method to run it. But since this is a very common scenario, like attaching a sink and running the entire graph, there is a run with method that just takes a sink. And here, looking at the type, uh, you may remember from the first slide that I said that like the, the entire st structure in Akka streams is called the processing graph, but the elements like flows, sources and sinks are also graphs. And here you can see what it looks like in terms of the API, because the sink that we'll be using is actually a graph, but with a shape. So all of these elements are graphs, but they have a certain shape. A sink has a sink shape, a source has a source shape, and a flow has a flow shape. Uh, so here, we'll be using the, the store readings. And we can also do, well, th th this returns a future because that, that, that's why we define the future of done here in the, in the sync. And that's actually what will be returned by the run with method. So we can use the and then combinator on the future. So now it's nothing specific to Akka streams. It's just a, just a future combinator from Scala. Mm, and we can do some, some log, well, well, we can observe, observe whether it finished with a success or a failure and then do some logging. If it was a success, we can compute the elapsed time. Okay, so let's see what the compiler has to say. I have SBT running here. And the compiler sees some problems. Well, the first of them indicate that we don't have an execution context, so the thread pool for a future. And the third one says that we don't have a materializer for running our, uh, running our graph. And this is, the, this is the place where we'll need to explicitly provide the infrastructure for running our graph. So as I said, so far we were only defining the recipe, how to process our data, but we also need to provide some, some infrastructure to, to tell like ACA streams how to actually run it. So let's fix those errors. Well, as I said, the, the default materializer in ACA streams is based uh, on actors. So we'll just be using an actor system here as an implicit uh, class uh, field, like the constructor parameter. Mm, so we'll say implicit system, uh, actor system. 
And now we, we need an execution context. So normally you, you need to be very careful when, when like deciding what kind of an execution context to use, especially for IO operations, because if you, if you use the improper execution context, for example, the global one, which can also be used by the actor system, for example, and then when you do a heavy IO operation, you may, you may starve the threads in the, in the default, uh, default execution context. So normally it's not a good idea to use the global execution context or the one from the, from the actor system. But here, the, our case is pretty simple. We just don't want to compile. So here's a disclaimer, don't do it in production, but uh, we'll just say import system uh, dot dispatcher, which is the execution context built in the, the actor system. Normally, you should be very careful what you use as the, as, as, the, as the execution context, but here, for the sake of simplicity, we can just go for the, for the dispatcher. So now we're left with a single compilation error. We need to provide the materializer to execute our, uh, our graph. Uh, so we can create it somewhere here because it's required by the run with method. So we'll say implicit materializer and with the val as well, of course. And we have an actor materializer that has an implicit parameter. Well, you may not be able to see it, but this is, this is the actor system that it's going to use. So if you look at the signature of actor materializer, it takes an implicit actor system because the default materializer is based on an actor system. So let's get back to the compiler. OK, now it's fine. Uh, so we have uh, we have a we have Cassandra running in a Docker container uh, with an Akka streams dot readings table. You can see that nothing is there so far. So now let's try to run our code. So you can see some log uh, messages indicating that there indeed are lines with an invalid value that are handled somehow. Okay, you can say that it you, you can see that it took like uh, nine seconds or something. So let's get back to to Cassandra, and yep, success. We have some data in our database. So you may think that that's it about importing. But we, ha we still have one more unused configuration parameter, which is called concurrent files. And now you can notice that what we are doing, we are processing like a file by file because, uh, because our source emits a file, t t t t reads the files, uh, and the, the, the files are emitted downstream to the subsequent processing stages one by one. And actually what we would rather like to do is, is to be able to, to load balance the, the processing, so, so to be able to process a number of files in parallel. So we would like to construct a load balancer that would just have a number of workers, and in our case, the worker would be the, like the materialization of the process single file flow. And we would, have, we would like to have a number of workers that do the processing in parallel. So uh, for, in order to achieve this, we will use the, uh, the, like a, a bit more advanced uh, things from a Streams API, which is called the Graph DSL. And uh, he, so far, you've seen the built-in stages, the processing stages, but you also have a possibility to define, uh, to define your own with, with, with some graph with a DSL. So let's see what it looks like. So we're going to have a balancer. And we have a graph DSL object with a create method. And basically what it does, uh, it gives us something called the builder that lets us manipulate the structure of the graph that we want to construct ourselves. And we need to make it implicit in order for the DSL to work. So we need to do one more import here. The graph DSLs implicit underscore to, to have some fancy operator that you will see in a second. And now what we want to do is we'll be using two built-in stages for, uh, for balancing and for merging. So the first thing we want to do when we have the files is we want to load balance them. So we'll use a built-in balance stage to, to balance the work among a number of workers. And then on the other uh, side, we want to have a merge stage that, like, takes, that aggregates the, wor the work of the workers and like, basically uh, and, and emits, it, emits it downstream. So the first built-in stage is, is called balance. 
it takes a type parameter. In our case, it's going to be a file because we will be load balancing files. And it takes the number of workers. So we have a concurrent files configuration parameter for that. We'll call it balance. In a similar way, we need to use the builder to add a merge stage to the graph. So we say builder add and now merge. The merge also has a type parameter. In this case, it's going to be a valid reading because that's what uh, that was the, the output type of the process single file stage. Uh, and the, like the, the, the number of workers is also concurrent files. And what we'll be returning, well, we'll be returning, a f we want to construct a flow. Uh, and to do this, we want to define the shape that our flow is going to have. In our case, it's going to have a flow shape. And when defining a flow shape, we need to define the input and the output. Well, that's pretty straightforward. So the input of our shape, uh, of our flow, will be the input of the balance stage. And the output, uh, oh, I forgot to assign it to a val. So this is a merge, and we're going to use merge out mm, as the output. And unfortunately, this is not enough, because uh, what we need to do now uh, is to connect the, the, the outputs of the balance stage uh, with, with the instances of our worker, so, so with instances of the process single file flow, and then connect the outputs with the inputs of the merge. So we can do it in a loop. Uh, we'll say for each, well, we don't need the index, but now what we want to do is to say that uh, we want to take the output of the balance, then connect it to the process single file, and then connect it to the merge. Now you can see that there is only a single instance of the worker, so that the worker is going to be reused, the process single file, but we need to be explicit about the connections. And uh, you may remember that the, w when co combining multiple flows or multiple stages with the via combinator, where the, the compiler guarded us against doing something wrong, uh, here the compiler doesn't, uh, doesn't guard us against, for example, uh, leaving some dangling inputs or outputs, but this everything is verified at runtime. So the materializer, before it runs the graph, actually verifies whether the, whether the, the numbers of inputs and outputs match here. So for example, if we, if we set concurrent files minus one here, there won't be any compilation error, but it would, it would, well, not explode, but there will be an exception at runtime because this is the, the outputs, inputs and outputs are verified and there, there cannot be any dangling inputs or outputs. So this is verified at runtime. And now what we can do is just substitute the process single file within the via combinator with our balancer. Now, well, we can run it once again. Uh, I don't expect any performance difference to be to be seen here because, well, it's n you, you, you would need to manipulate the, the number of files, the number of threads. Here are some, I, I just have some example settings, so uh, it, it may even be slower because, well, because of something. But if you, if, 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 if you play a bit with, with, with the numbers and with the configuration, if you want to, I encourage you to do so. The code, the entire code is available on GitHub, so with instructions how to generate the data, you can, you can just look, look at it and play. Here you can see that it's again nine something seconds. So no performance improvement, but if you, if you tweak the parameters appropriately, then there certainly would be a difference. Okay, so of course there is more to ACCA streams. There is a graph DSL that I, that I showed. This was a trivial example, but you can use it to, to do some more complex stuff. <coughs> you can also build your own, uh, your own graphs, uh, and there, there, is a, there will be a link at the end to a blog post I wrote about it, uh, which was actually contributed to the to ACCA streams, so now it's the part of the project. So you can use even more advanced uh, API to, to build your own, uh, your own flows and graphs. And in his keynote, Jamie mentioned Monix today, and uh, he said they are using Monix uh, because it was well easier to adopt 
for example, the NACA streams. And actually, just recently, I have written a blog series about comparing Monix and NACA streams, so you, can, you, you, can, you may want to have a look at it. It actually just touches the surface because it, com it, it, it uses the example I showed you today to compare how to achieve it in ACA streams and in Monix and what, what, the, what are the differences in the API. There is a bit about the internals, but uh, I think there, there are going to be some more parts of the series because, well, I, there, there is some interest in it in the comments. So perhaps I'll dig into some more details what, uh, what the internals look like. Okay, and so that's, that's everything I wanted to show today. Under the QR code, you have the link that it is under the QR code. So it's just a landing page with links to, to some additional resources, to the GitHub repository, to some contact information. So I encourage you to take a look. And well, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm here. <laughs>